Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Lynn and I am here as a customer service rep for Warmly Yours and today I am joined by... I'm Scott from Warmly Yours, what a coincidence. And today we're talking about, or today you can ask us anything is really what our presentation is on. So we're going to be going over some, um, you know, some information in general on our product. And then we're going to answer any questions that you might have about any of our products. Um, so some people have sent them in ahead of time and we'll be addressing those. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them either in that sidebar chat or at the bottom of the screen in the ask a question module. Uh, if we don't answer them right away, we'll definitely see it and get to them by the end of the presentation today. So starting out, Scott, can you tell us a little bit about our TempZone products and what we're looking at here? TempZone has been around for a very long time. Um, we started in business like in 1999 or before, and uh, we've had a product like this ever since. And this is a product that's uh, that goes just about, you can make it work for just about any floor that you have. Um, it's ca compatible with tile, stone, marble, hardwood. It's what we use to heat LVT and linoleum. And it can be used in shower floors and shower benches because it's waterproof and it's wet location listed in the U.S. and in Canada, which means it can go in the shower and you don't have to worry about any problems with it. Um, it's only an eighth of an inch thick, so it doesn't add a lot of height to your um, um to your your floor height a lot of people say well why don't you just make the cable thicker so we can we can pound on it more and then the the, the the answer to that is well a lot of people like it thin because then it doesn't raise their floor a lot if we made this cable like the size of a snowmelt cable then your floor would be you know two inches above your adjacent area so that's why it's so thin because it's very strong it provides a lot of heat and it doesn't add a lot of height to your installation it comes on cables just like there, you can see a spool of cable there that you can use to install it in your in your areas, your floors. And the thing is with cable, it's a little more uh, user friendly when it comes to curved areas and angled areas of uh, the roll product, which we sell the most of. The roll product is really great for rectangular areas because you're taking a, a rectangular system and rolling it out and then cutting the mesh and turning it. And that's really good at fix, uh, uh, filling rectangular areas, whereas the cable is really good at fixing non-rectangular areas. Awesome. So talking about cable, Scott, you had kind of touched on that briefly. Um, two ways to install cable. One is a fixing or using fixing strips, which are those little red um, uh, plastic pieces that you see in the bottom right over there, um, where they can just be laid out along the edges of the room or the edge of where you're heating, and then you can just kind of string that cable back and forth. Um, and then we also, which again is really great for, like you said, like those harder to reach areas, those places that are a little bit more, you know, not just a perfect rectangle or square. It's also right. a little bit cheaper as well. It's a little more labor intensive, but you can save some money doing it that way. And then the Prodesso membrane is the other way to install these cables. Uh, this is an uncoupling membrane, so it's going to add some extra support to your tile floors. And you would just uh, be able to kind of snap that cable into those channels and again, be able to run it back and forth and do some interesting, you know, shapes and things like that if needed. Yeah, the thing is, um, we don't rely on the Prodesso to lay our cable down. You can use Prodesso or you can use the strips. A lot of our competitors don't have that flexibility and they just sell you the membrane even if you don't need it. Um, and there are a lot of floors that don't need the membrane. Um, so it's it's an extra cost that you don't have to incur. So if you're looking at definitely budget installation, cable and fixing strips, are the least expensive way to go. So we already have a question, Lynn, and the question is, how do I submit a question? And simply uh, that goes out to Edward. You just type it exactly where you type that question, Edward, and then we will be glad to answer your question. Absolutely. Okay, I just had to do some some uh, <laughs> some housekeeping, housekeeping. Here to make sure everything was good. So. Um, yeah, the, the Prodesso membrane, it doesn't add a lot of height to it. Uh, they're both about the same height, the strips or the membrane. However, the obviously the strips are going to be much less expensive than the membrane is. So 
So our other floor heating or our other most popular floor heating product, I should say, is our Environ system. So these are, again, all electric. Uh, they do look a little bit different. The cable is a little bit different. Um, and this is going to be going underneath. You can put it under carpet if you're in the States and you can put it under laminate or floating or engineered hardwood um, pretty much anywhere. And then these do come in both rolls and mats. So we have, you know, pre-sized mats that you can just put in one specific space, uh, maybe a small bathroom or something like that. And then we also have those rolls that can be cut and turned. And can you tell us, Scott, a little bit about the, the technical specifications behind Environ? Uh, Environ is between 10 and 12 watts per square foot, so it provides a lot of heat. Um, the, the, the mats, the uh, easy mats, are our fastest and easiest installation men, uh, method. It's simply, a, uh, it's like a great big pad, like a, like a big thing that you would unroll and you lay it out on the floor and you put the flooring over the top of it. It's the fastest and easiest installation when it comes to environ it's done with floating applications so it attaches to nothing so the environ does not attach to the subfloor and the final flooring does not attach to it everything that's used with this product is a floating installation and that would be um, like uh, engineered hardwood or laminate i did not say lvt and carpet in the usa so if you're doing carpet in the usa what you do is you would use a, a carpet a pad that has a good R value, which most half inch rebond has. And then you get that rebond down on the subfloor and then you put this product on top of it. And then you stretch the, you put the stretch in carpet above it and then stretch it and your installation is done. Um, large areas can be done with one mat. So you really only have sometimes only one connection at the thermostat. So as I said, it is the fastest installation that you can do because there's no thin set to mix, there's no glue, there's no none of that stuff. But the thing to keep in mind is with Environ, it never sits on two hard surfaces. So you can't have a hard surface below it and above it because they do this and eventually that will abrade through the wire. Years and years and years down the road, it will wear it down like sandpaper. So that's why one side has to be on a padded surface and we put that padded surface over the subfloor and then lay this product on top of it. If you take a really close look at this roll, you can see that the wires are exposed on the edges. I don't know if you can see that on, no, you probably can't see that on my, um, that's one of the product improvements. You, it doesn't show the cursor anymore, but um, what I'm doing is I, I wish I had like a, in, in honor of John Madden, I wish I had the, um, that thing that he would draw, a uh, telestrator that we could draw on the screen here would help out a lot. Uh, Rest in peace, John. But um, what that is, is that cable that allows you to roll the product out and do cuts and turns of the fiberglass reinforced material and allow you to turn it and roll it. Um, so this product, if you look at it, you can see the wire sticking around along the edges. Those wires, this side needs to be facing down. The Environ product, that's the big mats that you just roll, that you just lay out like a carpet, those can go either way. But this product that rolls out, if you can see the exposed wires, the exposed wires need to go downward. So that's Environ in a nutshell. That's some great information. Thank you. So looking at underlayment now, this is um, our Cerasorb. It's a synthetic cork. So Cerasorb is a really, really great product if you're going to be um, installing uh, somewhere with a concrete slab, somewhere with a basement, um, any place that has concrete, you're really going to want to make sure that you're putting some kind of insulation in between the slab and the heat itself. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on that, Scott, why that would be the case? Well, I wish I would have recorded the call that I just did right before I walked up here from someone in Texas who installed their cable directly on top of a slab and they were asking me why their temperatures don't get into the upper 80s. And the reason why is because you're heating the slab below the flooring first before it starts to heat the surface that you really want to feel warm. So what you want to do is you want to isolate the heating wire from the slab so the heat goes up and nowhere else. So any law of thermodynamics, no matter how simple you keep it, the if you take a slab that's five inches or six inches thick and time the amount of time it takes to warm that versus heating the one inch surface above that slab, you're going to get much faster heating times in that one inch application. And it's going to get warmer because the heat's not going down into the slab. So it's providing a thermal break. So um, I had to explain to him that they chose it not to use it. And they're going to get a floor that isn't cold. If you use Cerasorb, you're going to get a floor that is warm. 
So there's a difference between isn't cold and warm. And that's usually mid 70s if you don't use Cerazorb or 85, 84, 86, 88, whatever that temperature is if you use Cerazorb. So it does make a difference. 10, 30, when I started here 13 years ago, Cerazorb didn't exist. We were kind of used, suggesting cork um, because we knew that the cork made the heat go up instead of down. And we were kind of like the only company that was shouting this from the mountaintops. You need to get that wire off of the slab. And it's really, really done some great things for people that need that heat. And we also have some scientific studies that have been done, provided by the company that makes Cerazorb, that we'll be glad to send you if you're curious about that. Um, but the, the, the tests I've done with a thermal camera, you can see exactly where the insulation is in a room and exactly where it isn't, because we did a room specifically showing underlayment and no underlayment. And you can see with the thermal camera, it's much, much brighter and much, much warmer. So that's what's so good about underlayment. And it also lets you use this product with Environ because Environ, no matter we talk about the product that heats the floor, then the heating part we've talked about, the non-heating lead, the thing that gets the power from your thermostat over to the heater, that has to make its way across the floor over to the wall to go up to the thermostat. Well, that is about a quarter of an inch thick and that's where the Cerasorb comes in. It's a quarter of an inch thick too. That allows you to run the cables back to the wall without the flooring teeter-tottering over the top of that cable. If you didn't do that, you'd step on the on the wood over here, it would do this, and then it would teeter-totter over that wire. So the underlayment does a lot of different things and all of them are beneficial for your floor heating. Absolutely. So our other floor heating product is our indoor slab heating. And now like kind of like Tempzone, these do come on a mat or as a loose cable. And this is a really good product if you're going to be having a finished concrete floor. So if you're gonna be doing a polished concrete basement or something like that, this would be what you're looking for. Can you kind of talk a little bit about slab heating, Scott? I know there's a lot of information on this one. Yeah. It, it Back in the day, way back in the old days, when the only radiant heat that people were doing was hot water in a slab. What you wanted to do when you had flooring above it is you wanted to make sure that flooring had as low R value, anything above the slab, you wanted the heat to get through. So you don't want to heat a slab and then put something with an R value of five on top of it because it'll never allow the heat to get to your feet. It'll trap it in the slab. So back in the old days, you would get, you would heat the slab and we would do that now with this product. And then you want a low R value pad. Like if you're doing carpeting, you want a low R value pad and a low R value carpet to allow the heat to get through. If you're heating with Environ, you want a high R value pad to keep the heat from going down and a low R value carpet to let the heat go up through. So it's just a different idea. When you're doing a finished concrete floor, there is no flooring on top of it. You need to make it look pretty, but you also want it to be warm. This is the product you use. New installation with a non-finished, uh, with a with a floor that has its own finish. No flooring installed on top is the big driver with this product. Awesome. Yeah, it's not especially popular, but when people put it in, if they're doing polished concrete, it works very well. Yep, it's the only game in town for polished concrete and you want to do electric. So that's that's where this stuff really comes in handy. And the, the cable versus the mats, the, um, you can use, um, you can pour concrete through these mats. The, the mesh is a quarter, uh, inch and a quarter by an inch and a quarter. So all you need to do is to tell your uh, concrete uh, installer that you need to use sub three quarter inch aggregate. And that will allow all that concrete to flow through the mesh. It won't strain it. Like if you use inch aggregate or inch and a quarter aggregate, as it goes through the mesh, it'll get trapped on the top of the mesh. So all you'll do is you'll have liquid uh, concrete going to the bottom and a real rough um, aggregate on the top. So what you need to do, it's very, very to easy to install. Just say sub three quarter inch aggregate and the concrete will flow right through. Obviously, the mats are the fastest thing to install. The cables take longer because you're literally going to be using thousands of tie downs or tie wraps to hold it in place on your uh, uh, on your uh, reinforcement. So looking for a quick install, it's going to be the mats. If you're looking to do areas that are not exactly rectangular, you're going to be one to doing uh, using the cable. 
Or if you're looking to save money, I have some people who are willing to, you know, spend an entire weekend running the cable back and forth to save a couple thousand dollars. So exactly. it just comes down to what the priority is. So this is a really great example of our smart plans. So talking about our smart plans, you'll hear us kind of mention those a lot. These are our complementary layouts where we're actually going to show you based on your houses or your spaces, uh, dimensions and layout, what products you need from us and how exactly they'll be let, laid out in that space so that you know every step of that installation from start to finish. What we normally need for these is if you are able to send in a drawing of the space with the dimensions. It doesn't need to be pretty. Uh, you might have an architect's layout that is, you know, 15 pages and beautiful and really, really detailed, or you might be, you know, drawing it on the back of a piece of plywood. We've gotten both and we can make anything work as long as the dimensions are accurate, which tends to be the main thing. Make sure that you're getting us the size of the space uh, correct, because once you receive your products, these can't really be cut or lengthened. So you want to make sure that you're ordering and receiving the size that you need. So on these smart plans, this is one for one of our Tempzone Flex rolls. Uh, so there is a lot of really great information on these that you, you know, there's kind of a treasure trove of information when you're looking at these. At the bottom of the smart plan, there's always going to be a lot of information on the uh, electrical specs. So operating cost, amperage, wattage, um, things like that. And then you're also going to have underneath the drawing a bit of a key showing you um, where the start, the end, and the thermostat is and all of that stuff. Can you kind of you know walk us through scott with the mouse if you're able to where exactly the start and end points are oh it's it's showing up this time <clears throat> great um, <laughs> it's like it, it's it, <laughs> the first thing i have to stress i talk to people every single day seven days a week 24 hours a day the number one thing i try to get across to new customers or people that don't have experience with this is don't try to figure out how big of a role that you need, or don't try to figure out the length of cable you need on your own. It's hard enough for people that have experience to know how to do it correctly. Our engineers do this every single day, multiple hundreds of times per day. And the thing is, you don't have to wait for this for this thing. It'll probably be ready for you the next morning, and they're free. So even if you want to go to Amazon or go somewhere else to buy it, Get the design first because then you are going to get the correct product because you can't buy an 800 foot spool of cable and put it in a small bathroom and just cut it off when you're done. You cannot shorten or lengthen the heating cable. It cannot be altered. So what you need to do is you need to get the right size product installed or for your product, for your project. And the best way to do that is to send us the drawing. And on here, you can see, we show you exactly how to lay it out. We tell you how many amps it is, so you can tell your electrician that. It will tell you what kind of breaker you need, so you can tell your electrician that. It's all included for free. And you just go, here, electrician, here's my plan. Get me the right wire size. Give me the right breaker, all that other stuff. So we show you how to lay it out, so you don't have to try to figure out on your own. And we show you where the start is. That's um, shown by a triangle and a T for the thermostat. You need to let us know where you want your thermostat because if you decide to, hey, I've, I told them this, but I wanna move the thermostat over here, that's gonna be a problem. We have to redesign this so the starting point goes over here and we can do that for you. It's not a big deal. But if you if you were talking to the customer, they go, hey, you know what? I wanna buy over by the mirror over here. Okay, well, just let us know where you mark it. We will then redesign it for you and start the mat here instead of ending it on this end. So that's all going to be there. The most important thing is when you order it from, we know construction jobs are constantly changing. If you get a dimension of a room today, six months later when they're getting ready to install the flooring, that may change. If they change the size of the bathtub and make the bathtub bigger, well, that's going to be taking up some square footage on your floor. And now the product that you ordered for 100 square feet will not fit into a floor that's only 80 square feet now. You can't cut the product. You can't shorten it. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to cut it here and throw the rest away. You can't do that. So always, 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 we always say, check the dimensions. Make sure the dimensions are the same as they were when you ordered because a 100-foot square foot cable is not going to fit in an 80-square-foot area. And we need to know where the permanent fixtures are. We don't heat under these. Also, we don't heat under the toilet. You want to stay four inches away from the wax ring so it doesn't melt. And we also, if you're doing a shower, like here, we could also provide you shower heating um, product 
for the floor, also waterproofing, shower curbs. We offer all of that stuff. So we have a lot of different things that we can do in this bathroom. And this is just one of the smart plans that we do. So let's take a look at the next smart plan. And what's the difference between this one and the last one, Lynn? So this one is showing you how you do a cable installation with that Prodesso underlayment, so that blue uncoupling membrane. Um, so again, similar concept, it just looks quite a bit different. As you can see, that highlighted blue area is actually where the uh, Prodesso is going to be going. Prodesso, since it does add a height difference to the floor, does need to go under the entirety of the flooring, whether you want heat specifically in that space or not. So you can see it's going underneath the toilet, it's going underneath the vanities. This way, you're not going to have any kind of weird height difference in the middle of the room or something like that. And then again, the arrow and the black square showing you the start and the end. And then you're going to run this cable again back and forth in that um, in the channels of that Prodesso, kind of snapping it in, making sure that it's held in place. It's a pretty easy way to do cable, a pretty quick way to do cable, as long as you are following the instructions laid out in the smart plan. So it's going to show you um, at the bottom, or almost the bottom, there are two really important parts of this that I always like to make sure people are aware of. The first is that this is going to show you what your spacing needs to be for each run of cable. For Prodesso, the average tends to be 3.75 inches. And Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, that's three of those little pegs in each one, correct? Correct, yep. So you'd basically be doing, you know, skipping every three and then running a new run of cable. And then the dot in the middle, if you look by the tub kind of in that bottom, left of the tub, there is a red dot. That's the halfway mark for the cable. And that is actually going to not only be on that drawing, there's going to be a corresponding white dot on your cable itself to show you where the halfway point is. So that halfway through running the cable, you can take a look and make sure that you're in the position you need to be in, that you're not going to be, you know, running the cable too close or too far apart, that you are actually following the smart plan precisely. Yeah, and people will go, well, the cable I bought is like 10% less from a competitor. Well, the thing is, you get what you pay for. And the, the cable that we sell has that dot on it at the halfway mark. The last time I checked, nobody else was doing that. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to know whether you're running long or if you're running short before you get to the very end of the room. So when you're laying this product out, the dot should align over here. If your dot, our start point's way over here. So if your dot is over here, you know that you're, you're, you've got the wire space too close together. If your white dot on the cable is over here, it tells you that you've probably used one extra space all the way across, and now you're going to have too much. It's better to know that halfway through the job than it is to find out, oh boy, I've got to completely undo this entire room and start over again. So not only does our cable have the spot on it where the halfway mark is, it also has the number of feet marked actually on the cable itself. So you'll know how many feet are left as because it counts down. So if you discern the difference between our cable and the competitor's cable, it helps you do a better install the first time. And that's why it's, it's, it's such a good product is the halfway mark and also the footage mark. Every foot to let you know how many feet are left. Oh, yeah, that coincides perfectly. I've got a 10-foot run. My cable says 10 feet left. Boom, I'm done. That's it. That's what you, that's why I say you get what you pay for. So you're going to get a quality product. And the thing about Perdesso, and I don't want to go too far um, in the rabbit hole here, but if you find out that you have too much or too little, you can actually increase the spacing. So instead of going three dots, you can go four to help you um, use that cable up throughout the room. Or if you're running where you have too much, you can go two, three, two, three, two, three spacing instead of three, 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 three. And that'll help you use that cable up too. You just want to make sure that there, um, the watts per square foot limits in your state allow you to go um, over 15 watts per square foot. In the old days, you could only do 15 watts per square foot max. Now there's no limit in most states. That changed in 2017 on the National Electric Code. So if, if your state allows unlimited watts per, per square feet, you could do that two, three, two, whatever you wanted to do. Actually, two, three, two spacing is like 14.9 uh, watts per square foot. So that's fine to do too. But also keep in mind that the Prodesso has no R value, just like all those membranes that you see out there has no R value. So it's not going to isolate the, the cable from the slab if you put it directly on a slab. If you're going to be putting this directly on a slab, you'd want to put a, um, a layer of, 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 of Cerazorb down first 
and then the Perdeso on top of it to make that heat go upward. So that's what's so great about the Perdeso. It lets you change your, um, as you go, you can make it closer or further apart wherever you are. Just remember, the closer the wires are, the, the warmer that spot's going to be because the more watts per square foot you have in that spot. So if you do two, 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 two spacing on one half of the room, and then you do three, 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 or four, four, four on the other half of the room, this side where it's two inch spacing is going to be warmer than the side where it's four inch spacing. So also what you want to keep in mind is when you're doing these types of jobs is that a room on the second floor over a kitchen is that floor in that bathroom is going to probably start at 70 or 72 degrees as opposed to a room that's a bathroom on a crawl space in the middle of Michigan um, in the wintertime. That floor is going to be really cold. So you definitely want for the Michigan winters in the middle of winter, you want to have more watts per square foot on that uninsulated crawl space than you would for a bathroom that's on the second floor above a kitchen because the, the floor is going to start warm here and down there in that crawl space, it's going to start down here. So that's one thing you want to keep in mind also. Awesome. So then the smart plan with a cable with sleepers. So can you kind of describe, you know, what sleepers are? What are we looking at here? What's the application for something like this? A sleeper is a job where you're doing nailed down wood, hardwood, nailed down hardwood of floors. And we have videos that show a job that I did um, locally here a couple years ago that shows how that's done. If you're interested in heating hardwood floors, the first thing you have to do is ask the hardwood manufacturer, is radiant heat allowed? Yes or no? And if they say yes, okay, cool. Then what's the nail rate? Which means the nail rate is how many inches does the product have to be nailed down? Because that's going to determine the sleeper space. So if we look on this drawing here, you can see sleeper spaced at 12 inches. Some hardwood floors re uh, require eight inches. So that would tell us where these sleepers are. The sleepers are about an inch and a half wide and they're three eighths of an inch high. That three eighths of an inch high is going to allow you to have something to nail in. And then what we're going to do is in the spaces between the sleepers, we're going to pour self-leveling cement to the exact same height as the sleepers. So that way the floor is completely flat and there you can lay the wood down and nail into it. So that's what a nail down uh, hardwood floor installation looks like. So you need to know, first of all, is allowed. Second of all, what's the nail rate? The third thing is, is there a maximum temperature allowed? A lot of times these types of floors have a maximum temperature of 85 or 82, whatever the manufacturer says. So it's good, you, you'll need to know that because you'll need to set your thermostat for that. And the last thing is what temperature setback is allowed, which means if I heat it to 82 during the daytime, how far can I set it down when no one's gonna be on the floor? Can I, do, can I go from 82 to 70? Or can I only do three degrees per day going from 82 to 79? So there's your three degree difference. Or if they say, yeah, sure, you can go from 82 down to 70, that's a 12 degree swing. So you need to find out what that setback temperature is. A lot of flooring say two to three degrees per day, which means you just set it and forget it. You set it to the temperature and you keep it there all winter time. And that's a good thing about electric is electric. You can keep within a half a degree. Hot water goes up and down, up and down. It overshoots and undershoots, overshoots and undershoots as the boilers kick on and kick off. And as the pumps kick in and kick off, that temperature in a hardwood floor with, with hot water does this hot, 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 and then it gets cold, and then it goes back up and down. So from 82 to 76, 83 to 74, it just does this all day long, whereas electric keeps you right at the temperature all day long because we have a sensor that's put in right between the wires, so we know exactly how warm that floor is. So those are the questions to ask. Is it allowed? I know this is the boring part, Lynn, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just haven't had enough coffee today. Me neither, but... Um, we're going to keep it real. The thing is, you have to find out if it's allowed, what the nail rate is, what the maximum temperature is, and is a setback allowed. So that's that's what you need to do. And you also need to tell us which way you want the, the wood to run. Yes. So if you have an adjacent room where the wood is running this way, we know the sleepers have to go this way to keep it running all the same direction. So we're going to ask you, which direction do you want the wood to run? Obviously, we can see the wood here is running in this direction because the sleepers are the dotted lines. 
Awesome. So then we had kind of touched on earlier heating your shower area. So this is kind of showing you how you would be laying out your Tempzone cable um, in a bathroom that also has shower heat. So as you can see on this drawing, it's a little hard to tell. The color isn't super great, but basically one of the cables is like a reddish and one is green. And uh, this is obviously just for the drawing in real life. They're all going to be the same, um, but you're going to actually be able to see exactly where your shower heat will be, what the shower heat cable will be, and what the bathroom heat will be. And the reason that generally we recommend putting two separate cables in or even having them both on separate thermostats is that uh, showers can be notoriously tricky over time. Obviously, there's problems with water damage and things like that. Um, Scott, can you kind of touch on that? I know you see that a lot as tech support. Well, actually, this is a, a, a job that I did the installation of in a waterproof bathroom. So we had no curb here. Uh, but the thing is, if somebody uh, is putting the cable in and, the, and the, um, the plumber comes in and nicks the wire and damages the wire, or if somebody has to pump, you know, somebody has to do work on the shower floor and they have to do a repair or whatever. And then the, 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 the other five year later, the guy puts the drain in in the wrong place or, or nicks the wire. If it gets damaged, then you can just turn the section off in the shower and the rest of the floor heats. If you do this all with one cable, if you nick it anywhere, the whole the whole thing's gonna go down until you get it fixed. So that's why we suggest showers be on their own cable and sometimes on their own control because the shower floor along the edges can get thick. And if you're doing a mud job, you could have two or three inches of mud and then an inch of mud in the center where the drain is. And the thicker the application, it's going to take longer to heat. Well, the rest of the floor in the bathroom is only going to be an inch thick at the most. So there's a difference, heat, the different heating rate between heating this much or heating this much. So that's why a shower floor will usually take longer to heat because it's a much thicker application depending on how it's made than the rest of the floor is. So we always suggest two separate cables, two separate cables or mats, one for the shower, one for the rest of the room. And then it also might behoove you to get a control to control just the shower or just the shower bench independently from the rest of the floor. I see that especially people who have like a guest bathroom or something. If you're not going to be using that shower every time you're in there, there's no reason to be paying to heat it if you're not going to be utilizing it. Exactly. That's the good thing about electric heat is yeah. you can zone it and there's no need to turn it on when there's no one there. That's what's so great about basements and how, you know, the basement, if you have a basement that's used twice a year during Christmas and Thanksgiving, there's no reason to heat it the other 363 days, 362 days of the year. Doesn't make any sense. That's a good thing about power, electric power, is you don't have to heat that area. Just turn it on when it's needed. Spare bedrooms, especially. So that's what's so great is to be able to zone that. Awesome. And then last smart plan that we have for you is our environ. So it's very similar looking into the temp zone, mainly because it's a very similar application, a very similar installation, I should say, um, where you're going to lay out the mats according to the drawing and cut and turn them um, again, following the instructions laid out in that lay in that smart plan layout. That's what it looks like. It's the silver stuff. Yes. So that's that's the that's the product that we're talking about right now. So if you take a look at this drawing, you can see there's like a big space around the uh, around the the room. It was like, why in the world are you leaving all this area unheated? I think there's a problem with the drawing. Well, the thing is, in big spaces like this, like a big living room or a big dining room or or, or large bedroom or whatever, no one ever stands right up against the wall. Okay, no one stands against the wall. They walk around in the middle of the room. So there's no need to heat the perimeter because there's not gonna be anybody there. The second reason why is if you're doing a stretch in carpet job, a lot of times, obviously you're going to need to use a carpet stretcher. And the thing is you want to have a perimeter here where there's no heat. So the carpet stretcher, the teeth, when it reaches into the carpet and then stretches it out and puts it down in the carpet tack strip, you want to give that carpet installer some room to get that stretcher in. Otherwise, if he's going to, if you're going to be putting the heat right up against the wall, he's going to go whoop like this. He's going to cut right through the wire. Then he's going to stretch it. And then two days later, when you want to turn it on, it doesn't work. So that's why two reasons why we do this big perimeter of a foot, usually in most jobs. And that is no one stands there. So there's no need to heat it. And the second thing is you need to have a carpet stretcher stretch in that carpet. 
So moving on to some, we had kind of talked a little bit about our controls and how you're going to be utilizing them. Um, obviously, like we had talk, talked about, you know, potentially having a secondary control for a shower, zoning and things like that. So this is a really good chart. And if you're interested in seeing this closer up, we can always send you this information. And obviously all of it's on our website as well. But it's a really handy chart to kind of look at our thermostats and pick the one that's going to work best for your system. So we do offer our most popular model is our Inspire Touch. We also have an Inspire Touch Wi-Fi that does have an app so you can control it through your phone as well as on that touch screen. And again, these are the most popular models. They're really sleek looking, incredibly user friendly. Um, they're not going to have, you know, a lot of confusing buttons and things like that. It's like working on your phone. It's basically um, a little, almost like a little phone that you'd put in your wall with that touch screen. So it does make it really, really simple to program it and make sure that your system is going to be working with your schedule in your lifestyle. Now, if you have um, an enhanced, or if you're interested in the enhanced, this is going to be what you would want if you have that old, an old system that has the dial control. What was that called, Scott? The comfort, comfort regulator. Comfort regulator. Uh, so if you have that one that's a circle, the, the dial on it, that's, the enhance is going to be the best option for you. It's not as user friendly as the Inspire Touch. It's a little bit more tedious to set up. Um, so we don't usually recommend it as just, you know, your first thermostat. But if you're looking to get a better thermostat or replace a thermostat for an old system, the enhance would be a really, really great option for that. And finally, our Intrust is our non-programmable model. So this is really great for seasonal spaces and or rooms where you have, uh, you know, you don't want a lot of change in the temperature. Um, so where you have a hardwood, we kind of talked about that earlier, you don't want, you know, big swings in temperature differences. So this is going to be a really nice kind of set it and forget it. It's not going to be turning the system on and off. You're really just going to be able to set the temperature you want and it's going to be running at that all the time. Yeah, it's kind of funny. The most expensive floors require the least expensive control. And that's the entrust because you set it to a temperature and you leave it there forever. Um, the one thing about the Wi-Fi units is they do work with Alexa now and they do work with Google Home. So those are a couple of great additions to the Wi-Fi um, product there. Um, but really, the touchscreen units are so much easier to use if you don't have one yet, you don't know how easy they are. If you have one of the thermostats that we sold for 15 years, the TH-115 had the doors that open on the front. If you're going from that unit to this unit, it'll be like night and day. It's so much easier uh, because I've been here for a long time. We used to take calls. Most of our calls in wintertime was how do I program my TH-115, the one with the doors. And there's 30 minutes of programming. Now we don't even have programming calls at all because it's so easy to do with the touch units. It's simply touch this thing, what, what temperature do you want it to be? Touch this one, what temperature do you want it to be? You can make the morning wor warming temperature 82 and the night 81. You, so in the old days, it was like, what's your comfort temperature? 82, okay, that's what it is. But now it's like, I can make it 87 or 81 at different times of the day. So it's really, really like night and day with these, with these uh, controls. And uh, we had a question, um, Let's see which one that was um, in here. Oh, where where is the thermostat, thermostat placement. placement? Yes, very good. Thank you. The thermostat placement. Is there a good way to hide or tuck away the thermostat? Well, first of all, you have to talk to your local code expert because local the National Electric Code requires the thermostat or some other device with a switch to be able to turn it off in the space it's being used, which means you can't just put one thermostat in the middle of your house and then run the, the heating system in 10 different rooms. First of all, it may not comply with code. And second, that's about the worst way to run electric radiant heat. When what, people just think that we're trying to sell them extra thermostats when really we're not, because we talked about rooms you only use a couple times a year, rooms that instead of heating the whole house like a normal HVAC system would be, where you heat it, you turn it on to 80 and the whole house needs to heat up to 80. Here, what you do is you put it, the, the thermostat in the space you wanna heat so it controls just that space and then the other spaces can be off. So if you know you only use your, your, your living room at night, there's no need to heat it all day. Simply turn it on, put the thermostat in the living room. And the thing is, one other example, and I hate to belabor this point, but this is something we get asked all the time. Otherwise, I wouldn't bring it up. But somebody wants to do a, a central thermostat 
in their upstairs. Well, they've got electric floor heating in the big room, in the great room, which is full of windows and skylights, and it's got 20 foot ceilings. And they also want to use it to control the bathroom, which is a three by three half bath. Well, the, the three by three half bath is going to get much, much warmer than the room that's got 20 feet ceilings and skylights and all windows. So those two different types of rooms should not be on the same control because the little room is always going to be really hot and the big room is going to be comfortable. If you put the control in the bathroom, the bathroom is always going to be comfortable and the big room is always going to be cold. So that's why you want to put the thermostat where it is. It doesn't make any sense to do it otherwise and it may be code required. So you wanna check out that. But that was a great, great question, Fiona. Thank you for sending that question over. Absolutely. And then last point about our thermostats, uh, not only do we have the regular black and white for the Inspire Touch and Inspire Touch Wi-Fi, we do offer radiant crystal options now as well. So if you'd like your thermostat to match your decor a little bit more, if you just want something more unique, this is gonna be a really great option for you. And I know I personally love the golden shadow. I think that looks really cool. To each their own. <laughs> Well, that's what the color of like most of my house. So I think it would fit very well. So moving on to our instant quote system and kind of talking about our, our website in general. So if you are on our website, which is of course, warmlyyours.com, uh, there are a lot of really good tools on there to help you begin planning your system, to help you kind of get an idea of what you're going to be looking at. So our instant quote is often the first place to go. Um, this is going to ask for some pretty basic information on your system and, or on your the room you're looking at heating. It'll ask for square footage, the type of subfloor, the type of flooring, and other information like that. And from there, it's going to uh, give you different options to build your system from scratch. So you'll start by choosing your heating system, choosing your thermostat, adding any extras, and things like that. And this can be a really good way to, if you have like a very simple room, maybe you just have a perfectly rectangular great room that you just want to heat the entire thing and you just want, you know, you know, really, really basic, then this might be enough to get you the products that you need. However, if you have a little bit more of a uh, uh, detailed system or like we kind of talked about like a circular shaped room or something like that, um, it doesn't hurt to, this can be a really good tool for budgeting to kind of have an idea of what you'll be looking at. But we always recommend even for, you know, square rooms and things like that, reaching out to us, getting that complimentary layout plan so that you can really see exactly what systems you need and exactly how they'll be laid out so that you can go into that job with confidence. Yeah, about 900 years ago when I was in college, I worked at a delicatessen and um, <clears throat> you have to do things to be able to get through school, obviously. But um, in that delicatessen, it was what kind of sandwich do you want? What kind of bread do you want? What kind of meat do you want? And we're going to ask you the same question. What's your subfloor and what's your flooring? Because we need to make the sandwich correct. We need to make sure that you get the product that's correct in between those two things. So if you say concrete slab, I know Cerasorb first, and then the next we start building from there. But this is where we're always going to ask you, what's your subfloor and what's your flooring that you're going to be using? That's going to determine what product we're going to use. And I love this slide because it shows that there are multiple ways to heat this space, going from $940 to $580, still achieving heat in that space. And you can see there's the cable with the strips. You don't have to buy the Perdesso membrane unless it's needed. If you have a floor that's bouncy, that you want to make sure that your your um, your grout lines, your tile don't crack, then you definitely want to get the Prodesso membrane. But if you're using, if your floor is rock solid, you got a uh, six inch on center spacing under your bathroom floor, you don't need Prodesso. So you can go from uh, whatever that is, eight, 868 down to 580 just by eliminating that layer. So we're not gonna, you know, we're here to make sure that you get the product you want because we want customers to be happy, not us to get a sale. We're happy to help you out, whatever it is there. But obviously, if you're on a budget, then you can see the differences of what's what's involved in your floor. We have multiple ways to heat that area, and it's not all just one. You know, when 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 you have a hammer, every, um, all you can do is is do repairs with a hammer. So that's that's what we try not to do. We try to have multiple ways to do that. And one of the ways is to is not only tell us what the product is, but to use this tool. 
yeah, this is a really great one again on our website. So you can actually design or draw up your room with all of the information on there that we would need. And then you can get a quote or a smart plan from there. So if you don't have a really good drawing of the space you're looking at heating, you can use our design tool. So you're actually gonna be able to put in where furniture is located. You can put in dimensions and shapes and everything like that so that you can just send that directly to us and we can get that smart plan going for you. And the thing is you need to remember that you don't heat under permanent fixtures. So if you know there's going to be a bookcase that's going to be sitting on the floor and it's going to be in that corner, and it's gonna be there forever, you don't heat under it. Also, you don't heat, heat under cabinets because you can, it's not allowed by code. And so those are the things that you're going to be watching out for is don't put heat where it's not, don't, let's see how I'm going to use a double negative here. Don't put heat where it's not allowed. <laughs> Did that work out right? Yes. And um, also don't put heat where it's not going to be felt. There's no reason to put it under the bookshelf. First of all, it's not allowed. And second of all, no one's feet are ever going to be there. So those are the type of things that you want to watch out for when you're doing your installation. Perfect. So the heat loss calculator is another really, really great resource. Uh, Scott had touched on it briefly. If you have a room that has, you know, maybe 20 foot tall ceilings and skylights and it's all exterior walls and there's lots and lots of windows, that room is going to be losing a lot of heat through a lot of different places versus a room like you had said, I think a bathroom over a kitchen that's going to have, you know, lot of heat rising up in it. Um, maybe there's only one window and most of the walls are interior walls. That's going to hold a lot more heat in that space over time. So if you are interested in learning, you know, can this be a primary heat source, which is a question I'd say we get couple times a day, if not more. Um, it usually can. The answer I like to say is generally yes, but let's take a look at your specific room before we know for sure. The last thing you want is to spend all that money and time putting a heating system in, a radiant heating system in, only to find out that you're losing most of that heat through your skylight or through your windows. So this is going to ask for some information on, the, again, the room, the type of walls, windows, installation. It's going to ask you what the subfloor is, all that really good information that's going to tell us from there, um, you know, how much heat you'll be losing or how much heat you'll be retaining in that space. And we'll be able to tell you if this will be a primary heat source for you or if you would need a secondary heat source as well. So, yeah, we had a couple of questions. How much power is needed per square foot uh, that was supplied to us earlier? And um, obviously on a concrete slab where it's 12 degrees outside, you're going to need as many watts per square foot as you are allowed by the state rules. And if you are over um, a, a heated space, a, a kitchen below you, um, and you're on a second floor in a bathroom that has no windows or skylights, then you're going to be using one of our lesser watt per square foot outputs, which would be with cable spaced a little bit wider. So we start at around 15. That's the industry norm is around 15 watts per square foot because that used to be the rule. Um, and we were always right at the cutting edge of that. We wanted to make sure we got as much heat into the space as we could. So we like to, I like to make things as graphic and easy to remember um, as possible. And I, I like to think of these heat loss monsters that rest in your bathroom. And the only reason I bring it up this way is because I've gone to dozens of installations. I'm the guy that that people call some, I'm not getting as much heat as I thought I was going to get, or my floor, I don't think is working correctly. Well, this one person called and said, my bathroom, I asked it to get 84 degrees and it's only getting to 82 every day, 82, 82, 82. I want you to come over and look at it. So um, I, I go over to the house and I go, okay, well, can you show me where the bathroom is? So we walk through the master bedroom. We, we go into the bathroom. And as soon as I walk in there, the ceilings are 20 foot ceilings. It's uh, three sides of the room are exterior walls and they're all exterior walls with two or three windows per exterior wall. Then I look around and this is obviously a really nice bathroom. There is a fireplace over in the corner and there's two or three skylights in the roof. Skylights, fire, fire, um, fireplaces, exterior walls, exterior walls with windows. Those are all monsters. They are all eating up all the heat that the system can provide. So the hit, the system was providing heat, but the thing is all of these monsters were taking the heat away from the space. So that's the problem. Even though the even though we're trying to heat the floor, all these 
ways to get the heat to get out of that room cause the floor to never get to where they really wanted to get it. So that's just, I, 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 it may be boring for some, but that's kind of like a real world story that I can share with you that shows you the impact of walls, ceiling height, windows, fireplaces, all those monsters that eat up all that heat, how they can affect the space that you're trying to heat. Very, very important to keep that in mind. So we know doing this heat loss calculator, how many BTUs that space is going to need. Then we can say, well, we have enough BTUs. Yes, it'll probably work. Or there's just not enough BTUs to heat this space. It'll act as a secondary uh, source of heat or it'll just warm your floor. So you have a warm floor when you step out of the shower. And then last but not least, we're talking about on our, again, on our website, our operating cost calculator. So similar to the, um, uh, the quote builder, you're going to be asked some information, some basic information on this, what kind of system you're looking at, like Scott had said, kind of building that sandwich um, with this is going to tell ask for the heating system that you're looking at, what size room, um, and then your energy rate. So if you know yours off the top of your head, awesome, you're doing better than I am, or you can enter in your zip or postal code or use your location. And from there, we'll be able to tell you pretty, pretty precisely what this is going to cost you per day. It is estimated um, um, but generally speaking, if you're heating a room that is relatively, you know, a normal size, maybe a little home office um, with maybe eight hours of heat, you're often looking at just maybe 20 to 25 cents a day. It varies pretty greatly, obviously, depending on where you're located. But it's not, there's a pretty common misconception that these are very, very costly to run. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. And if you get a smart plan from us, I mean, this is re relating to, uh, the question that Judy sent us in advance is how much does it cost to operate? It's right on the installation plan when we send it to you. It, it, it tells you right at the bottom when we look at those smart plans, right at the bottom it says operating cost. So um, we also tell you how many BTUs it makes. I mean, it's you're going to be getting a lot of stuff in that smart plan. So you may think we're just saying this to make you get one. Well, the thing is, when you get one, you'll know exactly what it's going to cost to operate, you know, that sort of thing. And if you're just doing like a sizing type thing, or I'm interested in getting operating costs, you just go to the website and you can play around. Now, the, the cool thing about that is you can change the, the slider there to go for, it's going to heat for eight hours. I'm going to heat it for 12 hours. I'm going to heat it for this much. It then will then show you the different amounts of cost um, that's going to be related to those changes. So it's really a fantastic tool. So um, I can't, can't tell you that strongly enough. And hopefully that answered the question we were submitted to. And then talking about the actual installation process, you want to have some tools on hand so that you are doing the installation uh, correctly and that you're not going to end up with some kind of faulty system down the road. So the first thing you want to make sure that you have is a digital ohm meter. And Scott, I know you have a lot of thoughts on these. Can you kind of tell us what you're looking for? Yeah, when you're installing a floor, you are going to need to buy these. They're not optional because part of the installation is that you do the readings on the flooring. I can't tell you the number of times that I've talked to people and I go, they say that my floor isn't working. I say, well, what, what readings did you get before you installed the product? Uh, I didn't use, I didn't measure anything. Okay. Well, what did you get after you were done installing? What were your ohms readings? Um, I didn't write those down. So now I have to try to troubleshoot a floor that I have no, no baseline to operate from that floor. The driver that delivered it may have, may have, you know, run over it and damage the wire before you even got to the point of installing it. And the only way you're going to know is with a digital ohm meter. The thing is, don't go out and buy a $400 meter. The meter you wanna buy is $19. It has a knob on the front that allows you to choose the different ranges of ohms. And that's the one that's the upside down horseshoe sitting there on the front of the screen. And you wanna pick one that lets you choose the different ranges, 200, 2000, 20K, 200M. You want to be able to choose that because an auto ranging meter is always going to be going high, low, high, low. Can I find these numbers? High, low, high. And it just keeps doing that over and over and over again. Get a digital meter, very inexpensive, $19 or $20 at any big box store. And you want a circuit check because circuit checks are, work, are working while you're not able to test. So a perfect example of when you get this product, if you are a store owner and you get the product that's a store, test it the day you get it. Make sure that it's good because if your installation is coming up in two weeks, you want to be able to get a replacement right away. So we won't know that anything's wrong with it until you measure it. 
So that's why you need to measure it the day you get it. Then if it's a okay, you take it, you give it to the installer. The installer goes out to the job, measures it to make sure his meter is working, his or her meter is working correctly, that it matches what you got back at the store. And then also that's your baseline. You now know what the ohms reading. Every mat has different ohms. They're not all the same. So when somebody, um, it, it's very, very important to write those numbers down. So once you get the ohms readings and you can say, okay, the ohms are good. We can now lay it out on the floor. So we lay it out on the floor, cuts and turns the mesh. We'd never, ever cut the cable. We lay it out. And once we lay it out, then we measure it again with the digital ohm meter. But that time that we were laying it out back and forth, I can't keep my fingers on the meter. I can't keep measuring. I have to have somebody else doing that. Well, the thing that does that is the circuit check. So what you do is you do your first test. You then put the circuit check on the heating product. You lay the product out. If you don't get any war alarms or sirens, you then test it. Everything's good. Okay. I want to test it before I start putting tile over. The last thing I want to do is damage this wire and then put tile on top of it. So we take the meter. We disconnect the circuit check. We, we measure it again. Everything's good. I put the circuit check back on again, and then I start installing the tile putting the thin set and the tile over it. Then at the end, I take the circuit check off and then I measure it for ohms again. And I take that number and I write it in the installation manual. That's required. So these, these things are not optional, especially the meter. The meter is something that you're going to need and the circuit check is going to help you because if you're, um, don't ask me how I know this, but if you're uh, getting ready to, to put thin set down on the tile and you take the, the thin set out of the bucket and you clear, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting your, your, um, now I can't even remember the word. I, <laughs> I don't know where you're your going trowel. with it. Now you're, there we go. <laughs> you're clearing your trowel. It's like I've got 10 different things going on in my head. None of them important. But I take the trowel and I hit it on the floor. I've come very close to hitting that wire. Even though I know I'm there putting the flooring in over a wire, I still clear it out, out of a matter of habit. So fortunately, I didn't hit the cable. But if I did, that alarm would have screamed at me and said, whatever you just did is caused a problem. OK, that circuit check is keeping track to make sure we have a circuit between the two wires inside. Inside each one of these cables, there's three wires, two that heat up and one that's a ground. So what the circuit check is doing is it's always making sure that those wires have a circuit that heat up. If they don't have a circuit, there's no heat. So it's always measuring circuit there. And it's also measuring to make sure that there's no ground, which means a short from the ground to one of those current carrying wires. So these two tools, if you use them, are going to cut down your problems during installation exponentially. If you so, just follow this simple rule, you will have problem-free problem -free installations. The way I always see it is it, to get a circuit check and to get an ohm meter, you're gonna be spending what, maybe 30 bucks total. That's pretty cheap insurance to make sure that the expensive system you're putting in is going to be working once it's in. Exactly. And then last but not least, our troubleshooting kits are another really, really great tool that we have available to you. So these are here to uh, troubleshoot any damaged floor heating systems that have already been installed. So maybe this is something, a floor heating system that you didn't use a circuit check for and there was damage to the wire um, or over time something seems to have happened, the floor isn't heating. This is going to help you not have to tear up the entire floor or replace the entire system. You'll be able to more or less pinpoint where the problem is coming from and fix that specific area. So you want to make sure that a certified electrician is there on site, is using these tools to help find the areas that need to be fixed. And I know, Scott, you work with these a lot more than I do. Do you have anything important to keep in mind for these? Well, we've come a long way. Um, I can tell you the first floors I went out to repair over a decade ago, we had this film that you would put down on the floor and you would start zapping the wire and you would move this film around every square foot to try to find out where the heat was. It was temperature sensitive fi film, the same sort of stuff that if you have a um, an aquarium, it's the thing that changes colors from 68 to 70, goes from red to orange to whatever. Only this was just black and white. It was it would be light gray for a hot area, dark black for a not hot area. So we've come a long way. Now we zap the floor. We've got a thermal camera. The first thermal camera that we bought was about $5,000 years and years and years ago. Now you can get one for your cell phone for 100 bucks. I mean, it's completely crazy how things have changed. So um, these tools, we use them to create a, a, uh, to fix a problem you, with a with a problem floor you either have a short that's causing a problem or you have an open circuit if you have a short 
you use this contraption over here, this big red coil, that's called a variac. And what you do is if you have a short, you use this variac because you plug it into a 120 volt outlet and then you turn it up slowly and the part you attach one of the wires to the ground and one of the wires to the wire that has a short in it. And then what you're doing is you have a circuit now between one of the load carrying wires and the ground. And what it'll do is it'll heat up until it gets to that spot and where that spot is, you'll see it with a thermal camera and where that spot is, is where your short is. So if you have a short, that's a very thing, easy thing to find. If you don't have a short, if you have an open circuit, then what you do is you use this high pot, which generates thousands of volts and you make a spark jump between those two wires that have lost their connection. And what that does is it creates a hot spot where those are and you'll hear it go thump, 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 thump. And what that'll do is it'll create a hot spot and then you use your camera to see where that hot spot is and that's where your open circuit is. So these tools are very, very valuable to do that. You can um, fix just about anything. I've repaired driveways, I've repaired concrete walkways, uh, I've done um, floors where they used a, um, a very sharp blade to cut into the grout lines to clean them. Very bad move there. That floor needed about 10 repairs because they cleaned every single grout line with a very sharp blade. Don't use sharp blades to clear your grout lines over electric floor heat. Now, because these things are very, very high voltage, these are for licensed electricians to use. These are not something that you're going to go out and go, I'm going to go get one of those things and, and put 2,500 volts in the floor and then touch the wire and go, oops, I shouldn't have done that. And, and then there's troubles. So um, one of the number one problems we have with people that aren't familiar with, with, with electric floor heat is, oh, geez, if something happens to this floor, I have to rip the entire floor up and I'm going to have to replace my entire floor. That's not true. People that tell you that are not telling you the truth. We use these parts to find out where that bad spot is. And then we lift up one tile or two tiles, whatever it takes to make that repair. And then you only have to put those two tiles back down. You're not ripping up the entire floor if your electric floor heating gets damaged. So that's one thing that I'm glad if you're even still listening, I'm glad you're here for that part. Because when people tell you that they have to rip up the whole floor, they're probably not telling you the full story. So good, good. I'm glad this slide is in here. Yeah, it's a really good one. So what makes Warmly Yours special? I know that we have given you a lot of information and we didn't talk an awful lot about Warmly Yours as a company or as an entity. So we have a lot of really great parts of our company that really set us apart from other heating companies, other heating products. So we offer no restocking fees. If you ever have to return something, we're not going to make you pay to send or to, you know, put that back. Uh, so you can order knowing that we have your back there. Um, we also offer 24 seven tech support of which Scott is one of our members. So you can call day or night anytime and you will have someone right there ready to help you, uh, so, you know, with any kind of questions, troubleshooting concerns, anything like that. We are there for you. Uh, again, and just, a, just, a, just, just, just to, to, to jump in here real quick, Lynn, as if I haven't talked enough already, but um, we are, um, we've been around a long time. We've been selling electric floor heat for a long time. So we have a lot of experience. So we are pretty much, um, we have a lot of videos on YouTube and we are spending a lot of time this winter in particular supporting other companies flooring because they either don't have a, a rep around that can do this work or they don't have the repair tools or they just wanna know how to program the thermostat and they, no one else is answering their phone at 10 o'clock at night. So we do support the entire industry and we're happy to do that because we are the experts here. We've been doing this a long, long time. We've seen just about everything you can see when it comes to floor heating. So um, that's why we're here. So that's, that's what it's all about. And the one thing, um, about the no-nonsense warranty. Um, we have, uh, I, I, I'm the head of the tech support department. So um, I talk to people all the time and a lot of people I talk to are, are sometimes happy and sometimes they're unhappy. And, um, but that's just the way it is. We're, our job is to get the floor working, okay? So we wanna get your floor warm again. That's why we're here. We want you to have a warm floor and we want it to work. The thing is, our warranty is the best warranty in the business. I don't lose any sleep at night going, oh, I really should have covered that warranty or, or I shouldn't have. We have the best warranty in the business. And that is 
if it's a problem with the product that we made and it's a problem, it's a defect in the manufacturing or there's a problem with that particular product that we're responsible for, we're going to pay the cost of fixing it. We pay the people to come out and repair it. We pay for the replacement product. We'll pay for your tile. We'll pay for your trim people to come out and put the trim down. We'll pay for the painters, whatever you have to be, whatever has to happen, we will pay that if our product has failed because it wasn't made correctly or, or the right way. But when you're doing an installation and you take your trowel and you drop it on the floor and it cuts the wire in half, that's not a manufacturing defect. That's not a warranty claim. That's installation damage. So there is a difference between the two. And it, as long as we clarify, if it's something that we didn't make correctly or we made it and we made it wrong or it intermittently works because it's something we didn't crimp it together right, that's our responsibility and we will take care of it. So that's why we pay. If you have to replace the whole floor, we replace all the tile, not just the one tile that's above the one foot of cable. Look at the warranties out there from other companies. They will, they will pay for that one tile and they'll pay for that one piece of wire to do the repair and that's it. And they won't pay the labor. We don't do that. We have the best warranty in the business if it's our fault. So um, it's very, very important to let people know that, that that that's why, that's what you get when you come to Warmly Yours. Absolutely. Yeah. When we say no nonsense, we really mean that. We're not going to give you the runaround. We stand by these products completely. And um, another really great thing about us is that we were one of the first or the first to provide an online tool for project planning. We kind of talked about that already, um, all of our different online tools. So you can really begin planning your project and getting an idea of what you're looking at just by visiting our website for a brief period of time. We also offer dedicated account management. So you will, once you reach out to us, whether you're a trade professional or a homeowner or a buying group, anybody, no matter how big or small your project is, you're gonna have an account manager that's going to be dedicated to you and to your project to answer any questions, to get your quotes, to get your smart plans, your layouts over to you. They will be there for you a hundred percent. And we also offer, like we said, more or less 24 hour turnaround on floor plans. So occasionally if it's a really, really large system um, or if it's a holiday, something like that, we aren't able to get it around that quickly, um, but almost always we're able to get it to you by the next business day. So once you ask for that, we'll get that to you as soon as we possibly can. Very good. So we did get some questions ahead of time, and I know we answered quite a few of them already, but I think we should touch on the ones that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so do you want to go ahead and start off with those, Scott? Yeah, the first question is, how do I heat an existing tile floor? <clears throat> There's really not much you can do with an existing tile floor that's already installed, um, except you can, um, there are products out there that do go underneath the floor between the floor joists. Um, we're very familiar with those type of prog products. We've installed them, we've tested them, and we weren't happy with the way they performed because they're below the floor. So we have always been heating an inch or so above the floor. Now you have to heat another three quarters of an inch or another inch and uh, underneath the floor. Then you have that heat another couple inches below that. Now all of a sudden you get a heater that's five or six inches away from the flooring. So that is... Uh, in theory, it's a great idea. We were interested in supplying that. We've installed it before. We just didn't like the way that it went in. And also, um, if you have anything in the floor joists like air vents or pipes or anything like that that won't let you put the heat in there, now you're going to have a floor that's warm here. This floor joist is going to be cold and this floor is going to be warm over here. It's really, really spotty coverage. So that's why we've never done that. But there are products out there that will let you. Different results depend on the amount of stuff that's under your floor and whether they can get at it. So there are things out there that you can check that out and you're more than welcome to. Um, we've tried them. We weren't very um, impressed with them. Absolutely. And the next question uh, comes from Edward saying, we have issues with thin set mortar bonding to the stairs or underlayment. Uh, I've gone out and looked at dozens of these floors and um, even we went one time with a manufacturer of Thinset and um, they simply said this wasn't mixed correctly. The, the Cerasorb is very porous. Um, Thinset, you should take, you should watch a video on Thinset on, on YouTube. It's really interesting, but Thinset, once it's mixed up and once it is in a certain point of time, it starts to grow tentacles that grow into the tile and grow into the Cerasorb. 
Well, the thing is, those have to grow into them. The thing is, if you put the cerosorb down too late, those tentacles are already out there and you're just trying to push cerosorb onto the tentacles and you're breaking them. There is no connection because it's been sitting there too long. That's part of the problem. If you mix it too wet, if you mix it too dry, if it's been in the pot too long, there's a lot of things that can go on with thinset. When you're doing an inset, thin set installation, you need to make sure you mix it exactly as it shows on the bag. And you have to use it up in the amount of time that it tells you to use it up. Because if you don't, it won't adhere to anything, serosorb or not. If you do the serosorb installation, what you do is part of the, the instructions is use the correct size trowel, put it down, put the thin set down, push the serosorb down into it, push it in, then use a roller over the top of it, then pull it back a little bit, make sure you have adhesion. If you don't, your thin set's not mixed correctly. So I, I can only go by, I've talked to thin set manufacturers and I've said, hey, what caused this to happen? Not mixed correctly or it sat around too long. So that's that's what you're going to run into. Um, that, those are the only times I've ever seen Serosorb not adhere. Yeah, there's not very much wiggle room for thin set and people need to keep that in mind when you're planning out your project. Also, one thing that's very, very important, I'm so glad this question was asked, is never, ever used pre-mixed thin set. That stuff is designed to never dry out. That's why they put it in pails. They put it in pails and they don't want it to dry out until you get it. Well, the problem is when you install it, it never dries out either. It stays this um, congealy mess, um, which is not good for electric floor heating. So make sure that you're using thin set that you mix up, not the pre-mixed stuff in a tub. I'm perfect question. Thank you for asking that, Edward. Yeah, great information. Um, so our next question is, my proposed application is for a is for wood flooring in a motor home on, uh, with subfloor that is three quarter inch plywood. Uh, they will be replacing the original flooring with engineered hardwood and will have uh, both 120 and 240 volts available. So something like that, what would they be looking at, Scott? Well, I'd probably have to get in the RV with them and take a couple trips back and forth across the United right. States just to make sure that I understood what they needed, um, especially when they would go into specific national parks that I want to go to. But well, you should be paid for that too as well. <laughs> well Normally yours should be paying yeah. for you. Yeah. And, but the thing is, what you want to do is you want to use something, since they said engineered hardwood, we would want that to be floating because then you can use the environ system because the environ doesn't use thin set. Thin set and a moving vehicle like that tends to lead to cracked grout lines and cracked tiles. You don't, you don't, you don't, you want to stay away from thin set and self leveling as much as you can. So the product you want to use is Environ because it goes, uh, it, it doesn't glue to anything and nothing glues to it. It allows the subfloor and the and the uh, flooring to move at different rates as the uh, as it, as the unit flexes as it goes over bumps or whatever. So that's where you're going to want to use the Environ. Send us a drawing of the space you want to heat. And then we use the Environ cut and turn product to fit into that space. And that way you get really good coverage of a floating floor and you don't have to worry about thin set cracking or self-leveling cracking. Awesome. Uh, so key, or what's the next question? I lost my place. Yeah, oh, one thing before we leave that, because he yes. mentioned 120 and 240, you know what I hate is, I mean, dislike is when people say, I want to use 240 volt because it's more efficient than 120. It's not the case. 120 and 240 are the same efficiency. If you're only heating 16 square feet, you don't need 240 to do it. Because when you're using 240, you're using two breaker places instead of one. And there's no need to put 240 in that floor unless you're going over 120 square feet because our thermostats switch 15 amps. And 15 amps at 15 watts per square feet is about 120 square feet of area. So most bathrooms you can do in 120 except if you have a big bathroom, then you would want to go to 240 because that allows you to still use one control, but heat up to 240 square feet. So that's the only benefit of 240 over 120. Otherwise they heat exactly the same. Yes, that's a great point. That's a common misconception I hear a lot. Uh, how do I compare the benefits of electric and hot water radiant heat? Well, electric, you can install in a much thinner subfloor. So you can, you don't have to worry about different floor heights from one room to the other. So, uh, these wires are only an eighth of an inch thick as opposed to a PEX tube, which could be three eighths of an inch or whatever that particular one is. Plus you don't have to buy a boiler. Plus you don't have to buy manifolds. Plus you don't have to buy all the pumps and all that other stuff that need uh, maintenance. Electric floor heating is maintenance free. There's no checking the, 
you, there's no inspection going on to make sure the pumps are working correctly or the boiler is coming on at the right temperature or any of that stuff. So if you don't have a boiler, there's no reason to, to get a, a hot water to begin with. So um, I hope that benefit being much, much easier to install because you're raising the floor height very, very little. And it's usually much easier to pull a, a circuit to that bathroom or whatever room you're trying to do, as opposed to now running PEX tubing from a boiler that you may or may not have over to the other side of the house. So that's that's one of the benefits. And it's, it's a much faster install too. Absolutely. Um, the next question we have is heating floors underneath vinyl, wet areas, vertical applications, and exterior heating. Wet locations, our, our Tempstone product is wet location listed, which means it can go in showers, means it can go um, in, um, you know, in any type of situation there. Um, the uh, under vinyl LVT requires a flat surface to be installed over. So that would be our Tempstone product installed over, um, uh, I mean, under a layer of self-leveling. So you have a nice flat floor. We have a perfect video that shows how that installation is done. If you're interested, just drop us a line and we'll send you a link to that video that shows you how to install LVT because we get those questions every single day about LVT because it's so popular right now. Uh, moving on to the next thing, vertical applications. The National Electric Code does not allow electric heating cables in walls. So your local code may, your local code has, um, um, it, it has the ruling at, over the national code, but the national code prohibits using electric floor heating cable or any type of electric heating cable in a wall. So um, hopefully that answers your question. And it's very, very difficult to heat exterior because um, exterior heating applications are 100% heat loss. You try to warm your pavers and that heat that the pavers generates goes right into the air and disappears. So um, it's an application that not many people do and even fewer people have done it successfully. So um, exterior heating, the thing is our snow melting product is designed to melt snow and it has to be used outdoors. It cannot be used inside. Our electric floor heating product, which is designed to heat floors is not allowed to be used outdoors. So there is the rub. So it's very, very difficult to use a product that's designed for melting snow to making it a comfortable feeling because snow melt controls are on or they're off. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. When it's off, it's cold, and when it's on, it's warm. But there's no way to regulate that. So hopefully that answered Chris's question. Awesome. The next question we have is from Diane. Do you recommend electrical radiant heat in concrete floors, given how difficult it would be to both find the issue and then repair or replace the system? Well, we know that we'd rather have you install it on top of the concrete slab if you can. So if you're using floor covering over the slab, then that's where you'd want to install it. You'd want to install it directly under the floor covering and above the slab. If you're doing heating in a slab, uh, we've done those repairs all the time. People, as the problem with slab heating is people like to use rakes, which have really sharp teeth on them. And those rakes, if you hit them hard enough, can go into the wire. The wire is very, very resilient. If you try to take a knife and try to cut it, it would be very resistant. However, if you take a shovel and you're going like this with a sharp edge on the shovel, you have a really good chance of damaging that wire. So that's what you just need to be careful of. If you use your rake upside down, if you put a piece of masking tape or duct tape on the lip of that shovel, it's gonna make it much more dull like me, then that's what you wanna do because then it shouldn't cut the cable. So those are the things you're going to look at ahead of time to mitigate any problems that can come by later. And if you do have a problem that you can't, you know, that, that needs uh, fixing, we can fix it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our other, our next question is from Leah. Do you have any, pro, do you have a product for basements with carpet? And I think I can answer that one. Yes, absolutely we do. You just wanna make sure that you're putting down your Sarasorb and then you are using Environ for underneath carpet. And again, that's for the states only. Canada currently does not allow um, under carpet heating. I've got a little bit better way to do that. You wanna use, instead of Sarasorb, you wanna use a high R value carpet pad because then oh, that yeah. way that way you're using, because a high, bar, high R value carpet pad, you can get those into the, into the twos, into the threes of R value, as opposed to the Sarasor, which is only 0.75. So my recommendation from, pe from talking to people that do this is look for a good high R value pad, lay the, um, the uh, environment product on top of that, then a low R value carpet over the top of it. And that's how you're going to get the best results in the US. 
Awesome. I always forget carpet pads exist. So thank you, Scott. Yep. Uh, the next question is, can you send me any information on the product that gets installed under asphalt pavement, as well as the depth of asphalt needed for safe coverage without taking it away from the installed product? Well, this is a great question. And, um, you know, we talk to these installers all the time. And one of the popular things to, for um, asphalt people to do now is they want to do a single layer of three inches of asphalt and then compress it down. Um, I can tell you that that is, is a, a cheap way out. What we require, and we require it because we want the system to last, is that you use a two-inch binder coat over the top of your compressed gravel and your compressed um, fines and stuff like that. You're, you're going to roller that down. You're going to put a base coat of asphalt down, and then you're going to put the heating product directly on that first base coat of asphalt and then you're going to come by with a second layer of asphalt that's going to be about an inch and a half two inches thick over the top of it the national electric code requires that at least an inch and a half above the cable is there it needs to be at least an inch and a half thick um, so that's why we suggest that i've seen single pores where it goes from three inches down to mysteriously goes down to two and a half or to two after they roller it down and then you park your car on it and then all of a sudden you start to see the asphalt start to go like this like it's melting especially if you have big cars or you have an rv or whatever a friend of mine put in a three inch layer with an rv and then by the end of the summer there was a four inch hole under each wheel where it just like that well the problem is the cables inside that and all of a sudden when the asphalt is is falling apart it's doing this and it's going to ruin the cable. That's why it has to be done between two layers of asphalt. First of all, to give you that strength and to get you the right height from the top, which is a national electric code requirement of inch and a half. We suggest somewhere between two inches, or right around two inches is a sweet spot there. So you have to mean, you have to remember that the cable is going to last a really, really long time probably longer than your driveway. However, if your driveway starts to fall apart, that act of falling apart can stretch the cable and ruin it. So you want concrete is really good because it really doesn't fail very often if it's done right. So that's another reason why we do not do gravel driveways. We get this question all the time. Can I put gravel over the top of this heat and heated gravel driveway? And the answer to that is no, because gravel eventually wears away. And then eventually you're going to have cable that you're going to see from the top and that doesn't comply with the national electric code and within one or two days of that it's going to get abraded it's going to get cut and it's going to fail so hopefully that question led to a couple good answers i'm not sure i think it did okay. in my opinion and our last question is from steve can i use low voltage to heat my driveway um i guess uh, we don't sell low voltage solutions because we don't want transformers multiple multiple transformers to to have to be replaced. Um, that's why we use 120, 240, 208, and 277, depending on if you're a commercial or if you're a home, um, because simply that's the best way that we found to do it without charging you $600 for a transformer or, or $1,200 for two, or, you know, it just, it seems a, a, a bit um, uh, unwieldy to add an extra thing that could possibly go wrong. You don't want to do that. You want to keep it as simple as possible. And that's what's so good about electric heating in a driveway. You don't have pumps. You don't have all this other stuff that needs to be maintained. Pumps and 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 pipe and um, boilers and all that other stuff. So we strongly suggest, because we've had very, very good luck at it, is using a 120, 240, 208, or 277. Perfect. And if I if there are no other questions, I'm not seeing any new ones from anybody watching currently. If you have any more questions, if anything comes up, feel free to type away. We'd be more than happy to continue answering questions. Um, but in the meantime, we are going to tell you about next month's webinar. This will be uh, February 10th, again, as the Thursday at 1. Uh, and this is going to be discussing planning your next Radiant project using our quote building tool. So we're going to be going a little bit more in depth on that quote building tool on our website. And if you like these training videos, we do offer daily training sessions. Um, often they're hosted by me or Scott. Uh, these are usually at least once a day, often twice a day, uh, right here on Crowdcast. And they're pretty short. Usually they're between five, 10 minutes. You can feel free to pop in, learn a little bit more about our products, about installation, um, and ask any questions that you have, even if it's not related to that day's topic. 
we are currently offering 20% off of our Environ Easy mats. Again, those are the pre-sized mats that are basically just a big blanket you can lay out on the subfloor. So that is going to be 20% off for the rest of the month. And you'll want to visit our website for more information on that. And we always love hearing your feedback. We'll send you an email right after or shortly after this is over asking about your experience. So we really appreciate your comments, suggestions, and of course, all your compliments, which I'm sure you'll be showering us with. And how can they get in contact with us, Scott? Um, just about any old fashioned way, um, by telephone, by email. You can check us out on the website. Um, you, we're also all over social media. So check us out there. We've got a lot of examples of, of our installations. We have a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Um, if you're interested on how to heat a driveway, the YouTube videos. Um, last time I looked, our YouTube video about heating an asphalt driveway was, I think, at 1.8 million views or something like that. Awesome. And any video with me in it that has more than one view is quite a quite a, a victory. <laughs> so um, that is that's that's a great great uh, testament to people looking for more information. We also have a bunch of videos on our website too yes. that you can check that out. Just go to warmlyyours.com and hit the explore button. And then there's videos about application, um, you know, LVT. How do you install a uh, nailed hardwood? I mean, all the stuff we talked about now today. We have great videos on it. It's great. The videos are great overviews, but they do not um, act as a substitute of reading your installation manual. So my last point today would be to tell everybody, if you're interested in installing it or if you're going to install it, please read the installation manual because you're going to find yourself having a very, very trouble-free installation. Yes, we want to make it as easy as possible for you. So that is all we have today. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we threw a lot of information at you. So if you need any help, if you have any questions, just reach out. We are more than happy to chat with you about your project. And until next time, as always, stay warm. And be radiant. Thanks, everybody.